museums are playing active roles in transitional justice that is helping communities move forward and moving beyond the rule of being oppressed. Although museums often play the role of villain or perhaps accomplice uh, in these restitution dialogues, there are specific practices that some museums are using to help rebuild communities and cultures outside of the return of objects in which some museums are also um, participating. So a quick outline for the talk today is to look at these three questions. The first is, why are museums involved in transitional justice at all? It's not a topic everyone thinks about. Um, which museums are engaged in this work? And finally, how are they doing this work? In other words, what are the practices that museums are using? So first, why? So as we know, the work of transitional justice is never complete. We can't think of a society today where we can say, okay, we did it, it's all done. Um, so three of the museums I'm going to use as examples today were founded as a result of a legal process, either a Truth and Reconciliation Commission or a court decision. And these museums are continuing the work that was started by legal institutions in recognition of the fact that the legal process isn't enough to heal societies and ensure that the past doesn't repeat itself. Museums, through their collections, solidify memories, but also identities and values. They educate school children and transmit collective memory. They provoke dialogue between perpetrators, victims, and bystanders, and people don't, who don't know anything at all about what happened, about what the future should look like. So this is one explanation of why legal tribunals and the families of survivors have sought out museums as a way to convey the importance of protecting the values uh, of international human rights. Survivors fear that without uh, without active sites of memory, the past will be simultaneously be forgotten and repeat itself. Museums have been founded with the support of survivors and their, their descendants of the Holocaust, as you know, the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, the African Slave Trade, Apartheid, South African, uh, sorry, excuse me, South, South American dictatorships of the late 20th century, uh, and the rule of the Soviet government. So there are these types of museums all around the world. And they all have the express intent to commemorate victims, celebrate survivors, and improve the human rights of citizens locally and globally. And we spoke uh, somewhat yesterday in some of the presentations about um, why there was this rise of restitution cases in the 90s. And I know that there was also a rise of these kinds of museums that opened in the late 80s and 90s. And in my research, I found that they were motivated by um, the passing of a generation that that had experienced the mass violation of human rights, whether it was the Holocaust or the American Civil Rights Movement, uh, for example. So their, the survivors and their descendants were very motivated to, to found a museum to preserve their memory and to, and to educate the next generation. So number two, which museum? So I've already, probably more museums than you would think. There are lots of them. Um, but today I'm going to talk about four, one in Sierra Leone, Chile, Japan, and one in Canada. So let's move to Sierra Leone. From 1991 to 2002, Sierra Leone was engulfed in a brutal civil war. The conflict was fueled in part by the war in, the neighbor in neighboring Liberia under the leadership of infamous Charles Taylor. And the conflicts in both countries were caused by power struggles over the control of di diamond revenues, social unrest over unequal access to inadequate resources such as education, water, sanitation, and electricity. The conflict was known for its brutality. Amputation was a widespread tactic, as was sexual violence and the recruitment of child soldiers. Tens of thousands were killed, raped, and mutilated. Hundreds of thousands were forced from their homes. The war ended with the Lomé Peace Accords in 1999, but the societal pressures that caused the war remain to this day, and dem democracy is precarious. The Special Court of Sierra Leone was a partnership between the government of Sierra Leone and the United Nations, and it was established to prosecute the perpetrators of serious crimes against civ civilians. Over 10 years of work, the court indicted 13 people, including Charles Taylor, whose trial was moved and completed at The Hague. And in 2013, the court became the first special court to achieve its mandate and close since Nuremberg. The Sierra Leone Peace Museum, seen in the sketch here, 
is a project of the government of Sierra Leone and the Special Court. The Peace Museum was established as a legacy project of the court, on the site of the court, to honor the victims of the war, preserve the history of the war and the story of the peace process, build peace, and promote a human rights culture that will hold the archives of the TRC and the Special Court. In addition to preserving the memory of the war, the museum's goal is to build a culture of human rights in Sierra Leone in an effort to pre prevent future conflict. It's an independent national institution, and this is important for, for my talk today. It has board members that represent different parts of civil society, including war victims, youth groups, women's organizations, national institutions, and the government. And then from a personal note, I think it's significant that the Peace Museum is built on the site of the court, um, and it's also beside what is now the highest court in the land, and the law school. So it's a place where law students begin their legal careers, and then we hear that they are the highest, highest decisions, the highest court of the land. The museum itself has three sections, a room, rooms for exhibits, a memorial garden that contains uh, art designed by Sierra Leonean artists, and an archive that has the records from the Special Court and the TRC. Each of these sections demonstrates a different approach to memorializing and educating, and while the archives contain many, mainly written documents, the exhibits focus on visual displays, and, and one reason they do this is because there's a high level of illiteracy in Sierra Leone, and also because they want to target children. The Memorial Garden uses art to symbolize loss, it contains a bamboo frame that's used to represent the tents that many of this, the people lived in when they were in refugee camps. So I'm gonna zoom us around the world to Chile. Um, so this is a photo of the Museum of Memory and Human Rights in Chile. And as, as you know, uh, Pinochet's government ru ruled Chile from 1973 to 1989, controlling the opposition through torture, disappearances, and killings. And the military, the paramilitary police, and the justice system were largely compliant. After 1989, with the new government, the process of address, addressing the devastating human rights abuses began with the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission, established in 1990, and then a broader investigation under what was called the Valeth Commission in 1993. This commission was established to document the crimes that occurred under the regime from 1992 to 1990, to identify victims, propose re reparations, and issue a, re a report. Uh, and the commission found that the government used torture and detention as a method of political control, validating over 27,000 complaints. The museum exists in part due to a recommendation by this commission. The commission recommended reparations to individuals and families, as well as collective symbolic uh, measures. And the museum was supported as a project of one of these measures. The museum's website describes itself as an act of reparation, a place for memory and human rights. And the museum is situated literally on a foundation of human rights text. This area under here, um, inscribed into the walls is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, every article. As a museum, it has this dual purpose again. It serves to preserve collective memory, but also to educate the public on the practices of human rights. And one of its key practices is to partner with human rights organizations to run educational outreach program for youth on the principles of democracy and human dignity in order to foster a human rights culture for the next generation of Chileans. As you may know, um, Hansen's, Hansen's disease was once referred to as leprosy, and around the world, people with Hansen's disease have suffered severe forms of discrimination for millennia. Um, this was also the case in Japan. And although the Japanese leprosy prevention law was form formally abolished in 1996, there were policies of segregation that continued after that time. So people with Hansen's disease disease were forcibly detained in sanatoria. In 2001, a group of 13 patients brought a case against the Minister of Health, of Health and Welfare, demanding compensation for the violation of their equality rights guaranteed by the post-war constitution of Japan, and they succeeded at the court of the first instance, and instead of appealing the decision, the government entered into negotiations, which we've seen in some of the reparations cases, 
uh, and came to a settlement agreement with the plaintiffs. The government issued a plan as part of the settlement agreement to expand what was a pro small private museum into a national museum. And it was reopened in 2007 as the National Hansen's Disease Museum. According to the museum's website, the government shall pr promote public edification and dissemination of accurate information regarding the measures for the disease and take other necessary actions, including the establishment of a national museum and the conservation of historic buildings to restore the dignity of patients and former patients. The museum has exhibits about the history of Hansen's disease and the Japanese government's treatment of people with the disease. And a really important part of its role is to ensure that there is accurate, accurate information available to Japanese society. Japanese survivors were not only active in curating the exhibits, they, were actually, they actually are the curators, so they've been hired by the museum as the, as the curators. Um, and staff record survivor narratives in order to ensure that the experiences of this generation are not lost. Um, here are some of the booths with the survivor narratives. Another interesting point is that this museum that's really dedicated to survivors of Hansen's disease uh, has a resource center where it provides links to discrimination suffered by people with other illnesses, such as HIV AIDS. And this is another technique we see in some of these human rights oriented museums and transitional justice focused museums is how do you connect the experience, something that's not the same, but has similar, uh, similar features. So last, I'm gonna bring you home to my home, to Canada. Although this is actually quite far from my home. This is in Winnipeg, and I am from Toronto. Um, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights opened in Winnipeg in 2014. The museum claims to be the first museum solely dedicated to the evolution, celebration, and future of human rights. This is not totally true. It is not the first human rights museum, but it is likely the largest, and has galleries covering the history of human rights, indigenous rights, the development of human rights in Canada, the Holocaust, the Holodomor, and other genocides. Unlike the three museums I've just discussed, it was not established to, to discuss any one human rights event, uh, but I'd like to address the parts of the museum that covered the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and the relationship with indigenous peoples. So Beto has already discussed, described on Tuesday very eloquently some some of the history of our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was established in 2008, according to the terms of the Indian Residential School Settlement. That agreement settled a class action between approximately 86,000 Indigenous Canadians and the Government of Canada regarding abuses inflicted upon Indigenous children in Indian residential schools over the course of more than a century. The settlement agreement required, among other programs, reparations payments, and the establishment of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The TRC's mandate was to reveal to Canadians the complex truth about the history of the ongoing legacy of the church-run residential schools in a manner that fully documents the individual and collective harms perpetrated against Aboriginal peoples and honors the resilience and courage of former students, their families, and communities. And then part of the process was to work to renew relationships on the basis of inclusion, mutual understanding, and respect. So the museum opened before the conclusion of the TRC and the publication of the TRC report, but the curators of the museum knew about the TRC and its proceedings long before, uh, before the report was issued and also heard about the TRC through their content advisory committee. So they also had expert committees that included uh, legal experts, but also indigenous, indigenous experts. So the museum itself has several installations that concern indigenous rights, uh, but what I'd really like to talk to you about today is a, a different kind of intervention that the museum has engaged in. Um, it's a specialized tour. It's called the Mikinakea Spirit Tour in case you need help with the spelling. Um, in this tour, an indigenous guide leads the journey and relates sacred teachings of the Ashinaabe, Cree, and Dakota nations using elements of the museum's architecture to share stories gifted by elders. 
The program was co-created through an ongoing collaboration with elders and an architectural historian in consultation with the museum's public programming experts. The museum's website describes the tour as a distinct cultural experience presenting an indigenous perspective on rights and responsibilities. And it's a collaboration between the First Nations and the museum community. The tour is offered early in the morning or in the evening when the museum itself is closed, and so there are very few people in the building. And when I took the tour in the fall of 2015, the museum itself seemed almost superf superfluous. There was no discussion of museum content. The guide instead used, used places in the architecture of the museum to launch her teachings. And I was struck by the fact that in some ways, this was the real, the real work, the real opportunity for reconciliation within the museum. Because I, as a non-Indigenous person, was receiving from it, teachings from an Indigenous woman as developed by her community and taught in the way that they wanted to teach me about their rich knowledge and history. Furthermore, and this was really striking on the day, the guide shared her own personal journey about how she came to know her culture. So she was raised without any knowledge of her own indigenous culture and only came to know about it as an adult. And so through the process of learning to be a guide in this specialized tour, she also reclaimed her own culture and then was able to share it with this, with this group. Um, so as the museum develops and museum practice develops, I think that it's these special moments of programming and opportunities for dialogue where we'll see an opportunity for teaching and learning and reconciliation will develop through these practices more than the exhibits themselves. So from these brief examples, and, and uh, in conclusion, I can extract from this certain practices that museums in different parts of the world are using to, to engage in transitional justice. As mentioned early, earlier, we need to find ways to move forward beyond an experience of oppression while preserving the past. So the first practice is preservation. And in this room, I think we all agree that that is critical. And museums are experts in this. Using art, and this is seen at every human rights museum I have visited, both to express the victim and survivor experiences, but also to express contemporary views of the complexity of the issues. And it, we also see in Sierra Leone that art can be used to express sentiments that are difficult or, or impossible for people who can't read to understand, uh, and also for teaching children. So art has many uses. Third is, is sharing government governance. So museums traditionally have been hesitant to share their authority with, with different groups who have been marginalized and are trying to gain a voice within the community. And, Different museums, such as in Sierra Leone and the Canadian Museum of, of Human Rights have, and I'm sure there are more, have entered into uh, different forms of governance and included different groups in their governance structures that help in this transitional justice process. And finally, providing a platform for teaching. But this is not just teaching about history or art. We're also teaching about values and about reconciliation itself. And there are a few different techniques that museums have used. Some have partnered with outside organizations or the, the communities they're trying to represent to give them a voice and to use their expertise in conveying, uh, in conveying their own experiences. So in my view, these types of practices will be an essential part of moving forward while preserving the past. Thank you.